Um, but let's uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start from verse 17. So as we're going through this chapter, you probably noticed that there was, uh, it, it's pretty much split in half. The first half is talking about the, the length of your hair, you know, for a woman and for a man, and how a woman is, has been, was created for the man, and that she's subject to the man, and man's subject to Christ, and Christ is subject to the, to the Father. But then the second part of that chapter was about the Lord's Supper, okay? And I really, since we started this church, we've not had the Lord's Supper yet, and I was really looking forward to doing it because it is a very important ordinance that we would do as a church. Okay, when we talk about ourselves as being Baptists, Baptists are common, commonly refer to themselves, um, or one of the Baptist distinctions is that we have two ordinances. That's what's usually um, talked about. One ordinance being uh, baptism, you know, water baptism, and the other ordinance being the Lord's Supper. And, and, and they're both picturing the same thing. Because baptism pictures the death, or the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, okay? Focus on His sacrifice. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the grape juice, we are also remembering that broken body and the shed blood for our sins. Okay? Now, some people get too carried away. They get really carried away about the word ordinance. Okay? And let me just explain a couple of things. All it means, all an ordinance means is something that has been set in order for a church. That's all it means. Okay? In reality, we have more than two ordinances. Okay? One thing that we do uh, regularly as a church, we sing songs of, of him, you know, we sing hymns and songs of praise to the Lord. Hey, that's an ordinance. You know, we hear preaching of God's word. That's an ordinance, you know. Whatever it is that we do as a church, you know, in order, and something that we do because we believe it's something that's important, you know, a make of our church, a Bible reading, hey, all of that are ordinances. Look at your Bibles there in, in uh, 1 um, Corinthians 11, <clears throat> just on the last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, verse 34, just, just the last sentence of the last verse, it says, And the rest will I set in order when I come. So Paul, as he wrote this Corinthian church, says, Look, when I come, I'm going to set other things in order. In other words, there's going to be more ordinances. Okay? That's what it means. It means to set something in order. Okay? But, you know, when we talk about the ordinances, I just want you to understand, if we're talking about that, we're talking about something that is quite, you know, uh, uh, you know, respectful toward the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, beginning with the word of baptism, and then eventually um, observing uh, his, his broken body and the shed blood through the, the, uh, the bread and the grape juice. Okay? So let's, look, let's start off with verse number 17 here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. One thing that we need to understand about this church, and I've preached through the, the, the book of Corinthians in my church in Queensland, but one thing you need to understand, if you've read your Bible, you, you'll know that this is the worst church. I mean, this is the worst church in the New Testament, okay? And, you know, I've been, we, we've probably all been in churches where we're like, oh man, this is such a bad church. But honestly, if you compare it to the Corinthian church, it's probably one of the best churches that you've been at, okay? But what I like about this church is that it had so many problems but it's still the Lord's church. There's so many problems, but we still have Paul coming in and trying to fix things up, okay? And trying to get that church back that was, you know, to make them right with the Lord. And you need to understand this church was full of divisions. They had their favorite preachers. And, you know, that's fine. You have your favorite preachers, but they were causing divisions over the people they would like to listen to. You know, they would say, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, that's Peter. And uh, they'd be fighting about many, many things, even finances, and I mean, even the spiritual gifts, people that had, you know, uh, certain gifts to do, to serve the Lord. Some people were envious or covetous, covetous of what other people had. I mean, just read First Corinthians, and you'd be like, man, how is this church so messed up? Okay? And another area that they were messed up in was in the Lord's Supper. How they were administrating the Lord's Supper. And we pick this up here in verse 17. It says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not. Look, you're not deserving of praise for what you're doing here. It says that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. And when you're coming together, you're making things worse. You're not making it better, you're making it worse. Why is that? It says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. And we know that. There were divisions among them. Verse 19. For there must also, sorry, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So, so part of the reason why there's divisions 
is you've got heresy, you've got false teachings in your church. So that's really bad. But you know, Paul looks at it from a positive angle. He says that they which are be uh, sorry that uh, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, one good thing about having heresies in the church, when problems arise and there's not sound doctrine being preached, he says that uh, the, you know sound preachers, good men of God, will stand up against those things, and they're going to be made manifest. They're going to be made known as godly men seeking to serve the Lord and following after the Scriptures. You now, these might be men that one day become future leaders of the church, like pastors or deacons or or whatever. Okay. Now let's keep reading. Look at verse number twenty. When you come together, and by the way, that introduction was important, okay? Because I'm going to come this later on. The Lord's Supper is something that's supposed to bring unity to the church, okay? It's supposed to bring unity, all right? But let's we'll cover that later on. Look at verse number twenty. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, some people have read this verse and have has interpreted this way: when you come together into one place, that being the church, which I agree with. It says, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So some of you have interpreted this to mean, well, when you come into one place, you don't have the Lord's Supper. Okay, so in other words, we are going to have Lord's Supper. So if that was the correct interpretation, what we're doing is wrong. Okay, because we shouldn't be coming to one place to have the Lord's Supper. Okay, but what I believe that uh, that's not been applied correctly is the following verse. Because the following verse explains to us what the problem is. Okay, look at verse 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Okay? So here we see what the problem is. They were not having the Lord's Supper. What were they having? In verse 20, 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. The Paul's are you know, criticizing them. Look, yeah, you're trying to come together for the Lord's Supper, but you're not even doing that. Because you're making things worse, what you're doing is you're, you're all having your own supper. Okay? Now, first thing I want you to think about here, what is supper? When you talk about supper, we think about dinner, right? Dinner time, supper. And one thing that I, I want to do differently to what many other churches do, I mean, even fellow brethren, even fellow Baptists, is they would have a church service, and then straight after the service, you would have you know, a piece of bread, or not a piece of bread, just a little, little, little square of bread, and a little thing of grape juice. And that's the supper, you know. But no, look, when we read about the Lord's Supper, it's dinner. It's food, right? It's not the Lord's breakfast. It's not the Lord's brunch or the Lord's lunch. Okay? It's not the Lord's snack. It's the Lord's Supper. So what we're going to be doing as a church, once the formal service is finished, we're going to get some pizzas, right? We're going to have some supper. And then we're going to share with uh, um, the bread and the grape juice and, and, and have that somber moment remembering his crucifixion. But notice in verse 21, so what was going on? Uh, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Okay? So because everyone's just eating their own supper in the church, there are people that are uh, being, uh, aren't eating. You know, they're coming to the table and there's nothing left. People aren't waiting, people aren't sharing. And it says, and another is drunken. Now, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, but I'll tell you now. It means that person's filled. Okay? That person's full of drink and there are other people that are thirsty. Now I want to correct another interpretation that I'm familiar with in verse 21 where it says, and another is drunken. What they say there is that that word drunken there means intoxicated. Means, you know, you're drunk. You know, as, as, if you were to drink alcohol and you were to get drunk, people have interpreted this, some of people, and have said, well, see, this proves when they had the Lord's Supper that the grape juice wasn't freshly squeezed grape juice. They'll say this means the grape juice was alcoholic. Because look, they're drunken. Okay? Now here's the thing about this. And I haven't even preached on alcohol yet, but one day I will. Okay, but let me just say we shouldn't be drinking alcohol. Again, the Bible's quite clear about this, okay? And even the verses that people use to suggest you can, they're easily interpreted, they're easily understood when, when, once you understand the whole concept of, of alcohol. So let me say a couple of things here. In the 1600s, when the King James Bible was translated, I mean, you guys know, you read your Bibles, there are words that you, you know we don't use today. Okay? And uh, the word drunken back in the 1600s just was the past tense of drink. The way we say drank today, it would say drunk or drunken. Okay? 
Now, what you'll find in the Bible, in the King James Bible, as you read through it, that sometimes the word drunken does refer to intoxication, does refer to someone that is drunk. Yeah, I acknowledge that, I accept that, okay? Uh, but it also is used as someone that's, that's, that's full, filled, or past tense of drink, okay? Now, um, let me give you an example of this. I'm just quick, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read to you from Lamentations 5.4. Lamentations 5.4, it says, We have drunken, same, same word, we have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. So here we have an example of the word drunken being used, but was he intoxicated? No, he was drunken with water. Okay, and of course water is not going to get you drunk and intoxicated. Alright, so um, so my kids, if you need some room, I'll get you guys to sit on the side here, okay? If you need some more room. Alright, so I just wanted to show you that, I just wanted to clarify that, that there's a reason, I'm going to go through the reasons why we, we, when we drink the grape juice in the Lord's Supper, that it's not alcoholic, okay? There's, there's more reasons than just the way it's written in the 1600s, okay? But look, let's look at verse number 22. Now think about this, let's just assume, let's assume for a minute that they were drinking alcoholic grape juice at that point, okay? That they were actually drinking alcoholic wine, okay? So let's just pretend that's the case, that there are people in church drinking all the alcohol and they're getting drunk, okay? Look at verse 22. Now we know that drunkenness is a sin, don't we? I mean, that, that's un, undisputed. But look at verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And so again, we see that Paul is, is uh, you know, shaming this church. I don't praise you that, you know, that you're, you're not sharing the food. That you're not waiting for everyone to partake of that. But notice... <clears throat> If this is about alcohol, he says at the beginning of verse 22, What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? So what would what, what that mean? He says, what, you're getting drunk in church? What? Don't you have houses to drink in? In other words, it's fine to get drunk in your house. Right? But of course, the, the Apostle Paul would not be saying that. Because we know drunkenness is a sin. Okay? So, I mean, just, just the context here, mix it with verse 22 will show you that that was an alcoholic beverage. The drunken there is being filled, being full, and not saving uh, any drink for anyone else. Otherwise, the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, go get drunk in your house. Okay, so of course, he wouldn't be saying that because we know drunkenness is a sin. All right, let's look at verse number 23. Okay, now we get into uh, the proper application to the Lord's Supper. So now that he's criticized, and now that he's shamed the church, now he's going to give them the proper instructions of how to do this. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had sucked, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So we immediately understand what the Lord's Supper is about. Okay? We understand that the bread is his broken body. You know, when Christ was, was arrested, he was taken, he was whipped, he was beaten, right? He had his beard pulled off his face. The crown of thorns were thrust on his head. You know, the nails went through his hand. We understand the brokenness of his body. Though his, we also know that uh, none of his bones were broken. But we're talking about the flesh there. The flesh being offered as that perfect lamb of God. And then we know that the cup of the, of the juice represents his blood of the New Testament. Okay? The blood that was shed for us. Not just on the cross, but all the way from the beginning of Jerusalem, or the whip and the beat, and all that kind of stuff, all the way to the crucifixion, and then uh, that being uh, the end of the, that sacrifice of the body and the blood. Okay? Now let's understand this, because Paul's referring back to the Last Supper. You guys are familiar with the Last Supper? Right? It was, it was the night before Jesus, or well, actually it was the same night that Jesus was arrested, but it was the night before he was crucified. Okay, so we're going to uh, go to Luke chapter 22, okay, take your Bibles, go to Luke 22, verse 8, Luke 22, verse 8, so we get a fuller understanding of what the Lord's Supper is about, Luke chapter 22, verse 8, 
Luke chapter 22, verse 8. Look at this. Talking of Jesus, it says, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. Okay? So this leads up to the Lord's Supper. So Jesus tells Peter and John to get things ready for the Passover. Now, what you need to understand is that... Um, let me see if I bring this down. No, I haven't read this down. All right, that's okay. But uh, this would have happened, this would have been on a Tuesday, okay? This would have been on a Tuesday, and on the Wednesday of that week, that's when they would have um, uh, sacrificed the lamb, okay? If you remember what the Passover represents, it goes all the way back to Egypt, okay? All the way went back when, when Israel was delivered out of Egypt, the Exodus, right? They, they came out of Egypt. That's really what they commemorate. That's what they're remembering, okay? We'll get into that soon as well, okay? But look at this. Uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 14. Drop down to verse 14. So, uh, yeah, I just want you to understand that they're getting the Passover ready, okay? And when they were to have the Passover, the remember the instruction that God gave them in Egypt? Was they were to have unleavened bread, okay? Unleavened bread. So we can understand if they were to prepare the Passover, that they would have the bread ready, Hey, but it wasn't just that one day that they would have the unleavened bread. If you guys know some of the feasts, they didn't have the feast of the, um, of, of the, so what they call it, the um, unleavened bread, the seven days of unleavened bread. I can't, I can't remember right now what they call the feast. Passover. Yeah, it's a Passover, but then uh, after Passover, it's about seven days where they just would eat only unleavened bread. Okay? So uh, I can't remember right now, was it just the feast of unleavened bread? Maybe that was, a, that was the term that was used. But the idea here that we would understand if they're going to be taking bread to, to, to commemorate uh, the body of Christ, that they would have been using unleavened bread at this point in time, okay? Because they went to prepare the Passover. That's what I wanted to show you there. But let's look at verse 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Okay? So remember, this is a Tuesday night. He said, look, I desire to eat the Passover with you. Okay? That would be my desire. But we know that they, it wasn't yet the time in which they would take that lamb and, and, and cook it and, and, and roast it fire and eat it. What we understand, of course, when Jesus Christ was taken and arrested and crucified, that he would become that Passover lamb. That he would be the fulfillment of the Passover. Okay? So let me just say this very quickly. I do not believe the Lord's Supper is the Passover, or, uh, or an updated Passover. No, I believe the Passover was fulfilled in Christ. When Christ comes and does the work that is done, He fulfilled many practices, many ordinances, and many uh, customs of the Old Testament. Okay, And so what I believe, what we see here as we approach with, with, the, with the bread and the juice, is that Christ is now ordaining a new uh, ordinance for the church. Okay, A new ordinance represents in the New Testament. Because remember, the, 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 the cup represents the blood of, his, of the New Testament. Okay, Now let's look at verse number 15. Luke 22 verse 15. Oh sorry, 16. 16. Uh, for I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he recognizes, I would have I'd love to eat Passover with you, but it's not going to happen. Because he knows what's going to happen to him. He knows he's going to be taken and crucified. He's going to be that act. Verse, verse 17, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also after the cup, so also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Okay? So that's why I believe this is a brand new ordinance, because it, it represented the New Testament, okay? Not the practices of the Old Testament, and Christ was the fulfillment of the Passover. Okay? Now let's talk about why unleavened bread. Why would it be unleavened bread? Okay? Now before I get onto that, are you still looking to I hope you still are. Just I want to notice verse 18, when Jesus says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. Okay? Now what is the fruit of the vine? We talk about the grapes. So when, when, the, when, when the grape is on the vine, is it alcoholic? Of course not. Okay, it's not alcoholic. I just want you to, to notice that, okay, because we're going to cover that later on. Okay, but he wants to drink of the fruit of the vine. So this would be freshly squeezed 
fruit off the vine, it's not something that would have had, um, given it time to ferment and become alcoholic. Okay? But anyway, um, I want you to go back, I want you to notice why unleavened bread? What's the significance of this? Of course, we know if, if they were preparing for the Passover, we know they would have automatically used unleavened bread. Okay, that, that's, that's common sense. But I want you to go back to 1 Corinthians now. Go back to 1 Corinthians and turn, go to chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you've been in church in the past, if you've been to other Baptist churches and had Lord's Supper, you're probably familiar with this teaching. And that being that um, leaven or yeast or some you know, bacteria that helps bread grow and, and, and uh, uh, you know increase, um, they would often say that leaven is a picture of sin. I mean, how many of you guys have heard that? That leaven is a picture of sin. Okay, yeah, quite a few of you. All right, and that's true. There's a truth to this. Let me show you this in First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. And these instructions here in 1 Corinthians 5 is about kicking a, a, a sinner out of the church. Now, we're all sinners, but there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of the church, and I haven't covered that just yet, okay? But this is, this is covered in chapter 5. But look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, so what's the unleavened? The unleavened bread? Look, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feasts. Hey, how do we keep the feasts of the Passover? How do we keep it? Look at this. Therefore let us keep the feasts, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the, with, um, the, unle sorry, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. This is how we keep the Old Testament Passover feast, okay? That we wouldn't be people of malice and wickedness, but that we would be under the bread of like, sincerity and truth, okay? And again, you read that chapter, you're not just talking about kicking you know, you know, major sinners out of the church, okay? And, and they're represented as that old leaven, kicking out that old leaven so it doesn't leaven the whole lump, so it doesn't leaven the whole church. There are certain sins that if we allow this church to, to go, it will affect everybody. You know, everybody will start, you know, thinking, well, if it's okay for this person, it must be okay for me. And that's how leaven uh, increases and, and rises, okay? So I just want to show you that, yes, there is a principle of leaven representing sin. I, I understand that. That's not, my, that's not my favorite reason why we have unleavened bread, but it is a legitimate reason, okay? It makes sense, okay? Now, <clears throat> can you go to the Old Testament now? Go to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Because this is the reason why God tells us to have unleavened bread. Okay? This is what the reason God tells us. Look, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 2. The Bible reads, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Look at verse 3. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith. So there's the seven days that I was referring to before, guys. Even the bread of affliction, look at this. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day that thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. What does unleavened bread represent? The fact that they left Egypt in haste, right? What happened in the Passover? Remember, they took the blood of the lamb, they applied it to the doorpost of the house, the Israelites did, remember? And then when God would pass over them, he would see that blood that would represent the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he would say, yes, these are my people, and I will protect them, but for the household of the Egyptians, which didn't have the blood of the lamb put in the posts, you know, the firstborn died. The firstborn child, the firstborn of all the creatures of the land of Egypt died. And even, even the firstborn of, of, uh, of Pharaoh, the king Pharaoh, uh, died. You know, and that brought great mourning, great judgment upon Egypt. And it's for that reason that Pharaoh allowed um, the Israelites to leave. You know, the Exodus, and they left Egypt, and they left in haste. If you also remember, we haven't got time to cover it all, but if you remember, you know, it wasn't just, you know, the, the, the unleavened bread and, and the lamb and the blood. They were also instructed, the Israelites, to be ready 
put your shoes on, be dressed, you know, be ready to go. You know, go and ask, you know, neighbors for, for even, even uh, like uh, gold and jewelry and stuff so you could have some finances on your way. Okay? As soon as it happened, the next morning they were allowed to go free. They stepped out of the doorpost. They stepped out of the blood of the lamb, if you want that way, and they left Egypt. You know what that pictures? That pictures our salvation. That pictures our salvation. When we, when we come to the blood of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, it means we are saved with haste. We're saved immediately. We come out of that blood, as, as it were, and we are saved right now. Salvation is not a process. Salvation does not take time. If someone has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they receive eternal life right now. Immediately they're saved. Praise God. Okay? And it's such a wicked thing when you have certain churches that say, well, I don't know if you're saved. Let me watch you for a while. Let me make sure that you know, you're coming to church, you're reading your Bible, I can see works in your life, and I can see that you're growing and developing. Then, you know, once you reach the level of my satisfaction, then I'll classify you as saved. No, salvation is not a process. It's immediate. Once the blood of the Lamb has been applied, they will leave with haste. Why is that important? Because if you make unleavened bread, okay, without the yeast, as soon as it's cooked, you can take it with you and eat it. Okay? But if you were to add leaven, if you were to add yeast to the bread, it will take time. Take longer time for it to cook, it'd have to rise, and they wouldn't be able to leave immediately. Okay? That's the whole picture behind it. That's why they had the unleavened bread. They left Egypt in haste. There wasn't enough time for the yeast and to watch it grow and all that kind of stuff, okay? So that, that's very important for you to understand. It's a picture of salvation. Okay, it's a picture of salvation. And a picture obviously of them coming out of Egypt. Alright. Now let's talk about the um, grape juice. Why do we have it with unleavened grape juice or non-alcoholic or freshly squeezed grape juice if you want to put it this way? Now I already mentioned it to you uh, when we looked at Luke 22 verse 18. Jesus says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruits of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Okay? So we know that the fruit of the vine is, un is not alcoholic. Okay? If it's on the vine, it hasn't been pressed. Okay, if it's on the vine, it hasn't had time to ferment, and, and etc. Okay, but let me actually, that's actually reason number two. Reason number one that I've got here is obviously the reason we have unleavened grape juice is because we really said that leaven is a picture of sin, and we know that Christ was sinless. Okay, Jesus Christ was the perfect Lamb of God, and his blood washes us away from our sins. Okay, so he was sinless, and so it wouldn't make sense to add leaven to the grape juice and, and drink alcohol and grape juice. It just makes no sense whatsoever. But number two, that Jesus says the drink was the, uh, the fruit of the vine. Okay, something that would be clearly unalcoholic. All right? Now, um, and, and the third reason, the third reason why we would um, have the unleavened grape juice is the same reason they had the unleavened um, bread. It's because it was with haste. Okay? Could you imagine if, if the expectation was for them to make alcoholic grape juice? I mean, how long does it take? Probably a week or two. It's like, all right, now we've had the Passover, now we've got to have the booze. All right, let's take out the alcoholic wine that hasn't been fermented yet. We've got to wait two weeks then before we can have it. Then we can leave Egypt. No, of course, they left straight away. They had the freshly squeezed grape juice, okay? So it's the same reason that, that, that he pictured um, uh, of, of that leaving in haste, okay? Now the next thing, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And if that hasn't made sense to you guys, please you can ask me afterwards, okay? You can ask me afterwards. I'm a little tired. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it 100% correctly. But the next thing I wanted to uh, look at this is how often, how often should we have the Lord's Supper, okay? Now, you might have been in churches where they have it every week. Or, I mean, like Roman Catholics. Some Roman Catholics have it every day. Literally, every day the church is open, they're having, you know, uh, communion, Okay? Uh, but of course, I'm just talking about you know the average Baptist church, the average church of saved people. Some people have it every week. Some people have it once a month. Some people have it you know a number you know maybe two or three once every two or three months. There are others that have it once a year. And let me just ask you guys the question: Why do you think some churches might have it once a year? I'll let anyone answer that if you think you might know the answer. Why would some churches have the the Lord's Supper once a year? Because they had the Passover once a year? Exactly. Because they had the Passover once a year. But like I explained to you, I don't believe it's a continuation of the Passover. I believe it's a brand new ordinance that Christ has instituted for the New Testament. Okay? So 
if you're wondering why, is it, why do they only have once a year, that's the reason why. It's because the Passover was had once a year, so they identify it in that way. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, okay? but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. How often? It says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So how often? That's not the question. It's not the question about how often, it's the statement of as often. <laughs> okay? As often as you do it, drink the cup, you know, take the bread, and uh, this shows the Lord's death till he come. That means the church is required to do this till when? Till the rapture, till the resurrection of the Lord. But it's not how often, it's as often. Okay? So look, please, if you're ever in another church or whatever in the future, and you're like, why don't I have the Lord's Supper more often? Or why do they have it so often? Don't worry about it, right? Just leave it up to the pastor. Jesus has not given us any instruction how often to do it, but the instruction is that we do do it. Okay? And as we do it, we are remembering the Lord's death till he comes. Alright? And uh, as, as I said, look, for us, I mean, the church in Queensland, guys, in Caloundra, um, New North Baptist Church up there, we have it maybe once every three to four months. Okay? And the reason I like, I, I like to do it that often is... Because when it's too often, it becomes like, I think I feel like it becomes mundane. I feel like it kind of loses its significance. That's just my opinion. I don't know. You might feel otherwise. But if it's only done once a year, like if you're not there for that church service, you're going to wait like another year. Like it's two years before you had the Lord's Supper. And you know, God wants us to do it often. He wants us to remember His death till He comes, okay? So I, I would expect, how often will we do it here? Well, right now, just because of the way we're set up, it's probably as often as I bring my family to Sydney. So it's probably going to be roughly the same, maybe every four months or something like that, okay? That we'll do it. And again, we'll do it with supper. We'll be eating together, you know, sharing with one another, waiting for one another, all right? It's not that one is hungry, another one is, 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 is uh, you know, um, uh, full, and the other one's drunk, and the other one's thirsty. No, we can't have that situation. It's about us coming together and sharing the meal together as a church, okay? Are you still in 1 Corinthians? Look at verse, um, chapter 11, verse 27. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 27. Because the next part is really important, okay? Really, really important. It's a warning. It's a major warning we've partaken the Lord's Supper unworthily. Look at this, in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So if you partake of this uh, not seriously, and you're not, or you're not worthy for it, okay, um, you're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You see what that soon means, okay? But look at verse 28. But let a man examine himself. So it's a time of self-examination. It's not for me to decide who will partake of the Lord's Supper. I think you should, you should know. Let, it says there, but let a man examine himself. Okay? And I would say to the parents, especially to the fathers, because you're the head of your house, is you need to make the right decision about wh whether your children should participate or, or not, on, um, on, on it or not. But I want you to think about what does it mean to be worthy? You know, what makes us worthy to God? Is it our own righteousness? Is it our own perfection, our own striving to, to please the Lord? Of course not. Okay? Because there is none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. Okay? What makes us worthy is that we're saved. It's the only thing that can possibly make us worthy is that we have trust and we have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If you've done that, you have the righteousness of Christ imputed upon you. When God the Father looks at you, he sees you through the veil, right, the, the veil of the righteousness of, of Christ. Okay? And that, that's what allows you to be worthy. That's what allows you to enter into his kingdom Okay, and to you know, bring your prayers and requests and fellowship with the Lord. That's what makes you worthy. Okay, but I do believe there's another application to this. Uh, but let's look at verse number uh, nine, uh, 29 now. First Corinthians 11 29. It says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Okay. So, wow, if you don't do it worthily, you're drinking damnation, condemnation unto yourself. The Lord's going to put his hand up, like, it angers the Lord, okay? It's going to bring his wrath upon you if you do it unworthily. So, we've got to be careful, 
You know, we've got to make sure that the people that are participating in this is saved, all right? But you know, I believe it's more than just salvation because, I mean, do you think every time we have the Lord's Supper, we need to examine ourselves, am I really saved? No. <laughs> like, this is not about doubting your salvation. If you're saved, you know you're saved, right? The Spirit of the Lord testifies that to your spirit that you're saved. You know you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But I also believe the self-examination is to make sure that we're walking with the Lord, okay? Now, here's the thing. I've already covered this. We already know that sin separates us from fellowship with the Lord. It's not saying you lose your salvation, okay? You have your position with God, and your position is worthy, okay? Your positioning in Christ is nothing you can do to lose it. The new man is saved, but we also have our walk with the Lord, which the Bible talks about a lot as well, okay? And sometimes our walk, when we sin, when we're in darkness, we, we, we break the fellowship with the Lord that we have. And so I believe the examination here is, are we walking with the Lord? Are we close to the Lord? And you say, well, I'm not. There are sins in my life. There are, there are things that I've done and I've not confessed them to the Lord. You know, does that mean I can't participate in this? No. Because this is a time to examine yourself. And we'll see later on. This is a time to judge yourself. This is a time for you to come before the Lord, not to me or not to each other, but before the Lord and confess those sins. Confess the sins that you've not yet, you know, that you've not yet confessed. And make sure that that's been clean. Make sure that then you can have that fellowship with the Lord and you can participate of the Lord's Supper worthily. Okay? Let's have a look at this. And I already told him this. We'll take, go through it very quickly. But go to John 13, please. Go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. And I, I won't go into too much detail because I, I feel like I, I preached this probably a month ago. So we'll cover it again just very quickly. John 13 verse 2. John 13 verse 2. And it's John 13 that covers the Lord's Supper as well. Okay? The night before he was arrested. Okay? But John 13 verse 2, look at this. <clears throat> and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then come and feed to Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. This is so important. Look at this in verse 8. You shall never wash my feet, Lord. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And this is your walk with the Lord. If I don't wash your feet, we can't walk together, Peter. You have no part with me. And we know when we're having the Lord's Supper, we're participating, we're taking part of his body and his blood. Okay? So we want to make sure that we're, we are part with Christ. We are with him. Okay? And that means we need to have our feet washed. And if you guys remember when I taught this last time, this is a picture of us having to confess our sins. Because as we go through life, you know, every day, we are accumulating dirt on our feet. We're accumulating dirt, sin, on our accounts. And it separates the fellowship with God the Father. And that's why we need to come and ask for forgiveness. Confession of the sins that we've committed, that we've, you know, yet not confessed to the Lord. Okay? Uh, let's, let's keep reading a little bit here. Verse 9. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth to Needeth not to sorry, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. They're saying, look, you're saved, but you still have some sins that need to be taken care of. That's essentially what's being taught here. Okay? And he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean, and of course that being John uh, not John. <laughs> Judas is scary, okay? What a mistake. Uh, but yeah, Judas is scary, okay? So, you know, I believe it's important when we come to examine ourselves. Yeah, you know, you, you know you're saved, okay? Those that are saved, you know you're saved, okay? But maybe there are sins you've committed, you know, today or in the past week, and you've yet come before the Lord to confess those things. And I think if, we, if you want to be part of Christ, you want to be with Him, and, and this is an important ordinance. This is, we're coming, we're, we're participating of His body and blood symbolically, 
Okay? So I believe it's a very important thing that we do examine ourselves and make sure that we confess our sins to the Lord. And that's what I'm going to give you guys before we do that. Uh, a, 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 you know, a minute or two just to silently pray and speak to the Lord and make sure that you've confessed your sins to Him. Okay? Not to me. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> and I won't tell you my sins either. Okay, but let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30. And uh, this is talking about those that participated in the Lord's Supper unworthily. It says, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What does that mean? They died. That's what it means. They passed away. Some people that haven't done this verbally have been sick and weak and even died. Okay? And so it's serious, right? But look at this, verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's what I'm saying. I think it's important for us to judge ourselves. Lord, we still have these sins on our account of you. Please forgive me. Judge yourselves so then God will not judge you in this manner. You know, making you sick and, and, and uh, weak and all that kind of stuff. Look at verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And we should not, uh, that we should not be condemned to the world. Okay? So if, um, when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Okay? So when God judges us, He chastens us. He chastises us. Just like a, a father would chastise their own child. Okay? Does that mean He's going to you know, make me lose my salvation, send me to hell? Of course not. Because it says that we should not be condemned to the world. Okay? There's, a, there's a difference with the condemnation that comes on unbelievers that participate unworthily versus those that are saved and partake unworthily. Yeah, God will chastise us, but He's not going to condemn us, He's not going to damn us to hell like the unsaved world. Okay? But let's look at verse number 33. Because this is what I wanted to drive home a little bit too. Is we started with the divisions. This church was really divided. Major problems. Look at verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Okay, so this is now, this is how we fix it, Corinthian church. When you do come together to eat, when you do come together for the Lord's Supper, tarry, wait for one another. Look at verse 34. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. So look, if you can't wait to get to church to eat with your brethren, and you're like, just, just eat at home then, okay? So, so you're not causing problems in the church. That ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Okay, so I think we see the fix there. What, what the Corinthian church was doing wrong. They were eating, they weren't waiting, they weren't tired to one another. They were, it, 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 just, it wasn't the Lord's Supper anymore, it was their own Supper. Okay? And instead, no, wait, tarry for one another, make sure you know, nobody's left hungry or thirsty. And if you are going to be hungry and you can't wait, then just eat at home. So you don't cause problems in the church. Okay? Now, so you can see it's about coming together. Unity. No, not division. Unity. Okay, unity. Now go back to your previous chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because the previous chapter talks about it a little bit as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 16. Okay? Look at this. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? What does communion mean? It means unity. It's where, you know, the com union. We have union. Is what it's saying. Okay, that's what it means. Communion, uh, unity. For it is not it is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Look at verse seventeen. For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. So it also pictures the unity of the church. That we, being many, come together and symbolically kind of like being that one bread that's being shared. That body of Christ. Because, you know, the, the Bible does say that the church is the body of Christ. So there's those uh, sort of parallels there as well, okay? Now, um, let me just end on this. And um, I, it, really, it really infuriates me when I see people complain about their churches, okay? It's, but in particular, not about, like, downhill heresy. I mean, there's reasons to complain, right? But I'm talking about when they complain about the Lord's Supper, Okay? Because the Lord's Supper, all it is, is, I haven't got it here, but all it is is some juice, grape juice, freshly squeezed off the vine, a bit of bread, shared, united. I mean, look, we might have some differences in doctrines. We might have some differences in secondary doctrines. We might have some differences in how we raise our families and how we interpret certain passages and we just do life in general, okay? 
Okay, but this is something that any believer, no matter how backslidden you are, no matter how carnal you are, or no, matter, no matter how mature you are, this is something that will bring everyone together. Okay, that being the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all have that in common. That's why it's supposed to bring unity. Okay, and it's a simple thing: we drink and then bread, bring unity to the church. You know, remembering what Christ has done for us. You know, if there's ever divisions in our church, I wouldn't do this this ordinance. I wouldn't do it until there's some unity in the church, and that's that should bring us together, right? Easy. But then people complain about how it's administered, and then they say, "Oh, my church is this way." I've heard this. You might say, "I've never done it." Well, I mean, I've heard other people say it. Okay, I've heard people complain about the church because of the way it's administered. Well, then you've got the wrong spirit. You've got a problem because you're the divisive one. <laughs> this is what's supposed to bring unity. You know, there are some churches that might require you to be baptized first. You know, there might be some churches that uh, have open communion, and the style that we have would be open communion. If you're saved, you can participate. That's open communion. You know, if we had a visitor come in when we have communion, as long as they're saved, they can participate as well. It's open to everyone that's saved. You know, that's that's how, that's my style. There are other churches that have um, close communion. Okay, close communion. What that means is everyone that's saved in their church can participate, and visitors from like-minded churches can participate as well. That's close communion. But if you're a saved person and you're not from a like-minded or in-fellowship church, then they won't allow you to participate of it. Okay, that's close communion. Then there's close, closed communion. Close communion. That basically means the only people that can participate are the members, the saved members in the church. And that's it. And sometimes the churches that do this, they will have the Lord's Supper on a day that's not a regular church service. So they don't have the visitor that walks in. Like it's, it's, not, it's not a publicized day. They just have church on, on some other day, and they have the Lord's Supper. They, they say it's closed, okay? And I hear people all the time complain, this church is this way, this church is Look, forget about it. It's supposed to bring unity, okay? Let, let the pastor, let, let, the, let the one that's in charge, the authority, take, you know, they're the ones that are accountable to God. Okay, so they're the ones that have to have a clear conscience with the way they do these things. Okay, so please never, you know, I don't think anyone's going to talk, you know, division here about this, but if you ever find yourself in the future in another church, don't make this a divisive problem, okay, because it's supposed to be a simple thing with remembering the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, um, I'll give you, and I'll give you, I'll end on one example. I'll end on one example here. Um, my parents, when they migrated from Chile, South America, they came from a Presbyterian church, okay? And I know that a lot of Presbyterians are like hardcore Calvinists, and a lot of those aren't even saved, okay? But there are some that are saved, because they don't have the hardcore Calvinism. And in fact, when they came to Australia, they, they look, they're like, hey, we agree with the Baptist church. Like, that, that's how they saw it, because, you know, the doctrine that I've been taught, the, the gospel, all those kind of things, was, was lined up with what they believed. So they went to that church. But you know how it is in some Protestant churches, especially the Presbyterians, is that their baptism, instead of it being um, immersion by water, they baptize little babies, right? They baptize little babies, they sprinkle water on babies. And of course, my parents went through that process. And as far as I was concerned, they were baptized, even though they know that that has nothing to do with salvation. Okay? And like us, we agree that water uh, baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Okay? Um, but it's something uh, that, that uh, acknowledges the salvation that you do have, because you're identifying the death and resurrection of Christ. But anyway, they went to a Baptist church and they were not permitted to participate of the Lord's Supper. Okay, and they petitioned to the pastor and said, look, we're saved, why not? You know? But the pastor had set a rule, well, because you're not a Baptist, you haven't been baptized, you know, you know, scripturally. You know, they haven't been baptized scripturally. So look, my parents have, have an option there. Either get frustrated, either cause problems. They felt they were baptized, you know, that's right. They didn't feel that they needed to have baptism by immersion. Now they should, because I'm a Baptist, I believe they should have. I'm not saying it's fine. But I'm saying where they were coming from, okay, they, they could have been divisive. They could have tried to get people in the church against the pastor. But instead, you know what they said? You know what? No. This is supposed to be a time of unity. This is a time of I'm supposed to be remembering the Lord's death. And even though, you know, we're not 100% on board here, we're just going to get baptized anyway. We're going to get baptized, you know, by immersion, so then we can participate in the Lord's Supper. And I, I, I really respect my parents for that decision. I do, you know. I think it's a great thing showing that they're not people that want to cause divisions and, and arguments over, you know, small matters, but they would just go with what the man of God said. They would just go to the pastor and, and, and make sure that there was unity in the church. All right, so we'll leave it there. Let's pray.